Production support for the Friday Zone is provided by the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation and by WTIU members. Thank you. Today, we're going to unearth discoveries that give us a look into our past. Oh! <laughs> and learn how some discoveries can even be found in your own backyard. Come find out if you can dig it. Whew. You're not alone. You're in the zone. So hang up the phone. And get in the zone. Get in the zone, the Friday zone. You're in the zone, the Friday zone. everyone, welcome back into The Zone. Today we are going to learn all about our past through discovery. And we will find out the key differences between archaeology, the study of people of the past, paleontology, the study of fossils, and anthropology, the study of cultures. Wow, that seems a little intense, Emily. You know, it kind of sounds like it, but honestly, Taylor, it's so much fun, too. Well, why is that? Because it's all about exploration. You can learn a lot by discovering something you haven't seen before. I know, like, uh, like the time I found an arrowhead in my backyard. I mean, I immediately started to wonder where it came from, how it got there, and who used it. You know, that's right. When researchers recover an artifact, a whole story starts to unfold. The history of one single object can tell us about how it was used, the people who used it, and even about an entire civilization. It is all a part of the archaeological process. We got a chance to see how teams of archaeologists and researchers come together to make discoveries at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis in this Friday Zone field trip. The Friday Zone field crew went to the Indianapolis Children's Museum to visit the Treasures of the Earth exhibit find out how archaeology and preservation help us discover our past. We discovered that this exhibit takes you around the world to three very different archaeological sites. You can stroll through the tomb of one of Egypt's pharaohs and piece back together his sarcophagus, or travel to China and see an army of warriors made of clay. We also learned that not all treasures are found underground as we explore a shipwreck believed to be Captain Kidd's. Archaeologists and researchers find that these artifacts they discover tell you a lot more than just their age. We spoke with Dr. Patchen to see if we could find out more. Archaeology tells us about ourselves because it tells us about the past and what it is about the past related to how people live. And in this exhibit, not only do you see how people lived, but you get to connect with the piece of history as you touch the hands-on activities in each section. You can x-ray the mummy of Seti I and see what he was buried with, or touch the hieroglyphics inside his tomb and decipher their meaning. And meet underwater archaeologist Charlie Beaker from Indiana University to find out the tools he used to find treasures that were lost underneath the ocean for over 300 years. Dr. Patchen personally traveled to the shipwreck to see about the research behind the Captain Kidd discovery. Was he a pirate? Was he a, was he a privateer? What, um, what was found at the site? So there's this wet lab where children and families have an opportunity to talk to underwater archaeologists. Archaeologists that are working on real projects to learn about the archaeological process. We found out more about this archaeological process by speaking with someone who uses it every day at their job. We spoke with Christy O'Grady, Chief Conservator at the Children's Museum. I work here in the lab on some days and talk with visitors and people say, are you an archaeologist? And I'm not, but I have a really fun part in the process, which is the archaeologists go out and find these wonderful artifacts and they know how to document um, where they get them and what condition it's in. And then they bring them to us and we get to make sure that they stay in a good condition so that everybody can learn from them. These artifacts can tell researchers like Christy information about where it came from, what it was used for, and how it got to the place they discovered it. All of these artifacts, all of these sites, have really wonderful stories to tell us. They, they tell us about the people who made them and 
what happened to them, and, um, and even about the techno technological um, processes that people at the time had. What were they able to do? And sometimes it's pretty amazing. One of Christie's research projects is a cannon that was found on the coast of the Dominican Republic at the site believed to be the wreckage of the Cara Merchant, a ship abandoned by Captain Kidd. This artifact is over 300 years old, and preserving it is Christie's job. It's the only cannon brought up from the Captain Kidd site. And at this point, it's the only one that they plan to bring up. If we took it out of the water right now, you would see the corrosion process uh, accelerates really, really quickly. It does help to remove all the concretions on the outside, but in some ways, actually, that's kind of a secondary process. Uh, the real thing that we're doing is almost invisible. It's moving those ions out of the metal. Um, and in doing that, the concretions on the outside kind of soften and we can get rid of those as well. I always tell people, if you want to see if it's actually working, you can see fine little bubbles that come up from the cannon. And that is evidence that the reduction is happening and that the process is actually working. Preserving artifacts and maintaining them for future generations is the primary objective for researchers like Christy. But by doing so, you also uncover a story that may be hundreds of years old. That's what we found when Christy showed us another one of her research projects. These are some pieces of large amphora. These, this particular piece is from a 1724 shipwreck. On this piece, we've already been able to reassemble a number of fragments from this broken amphora. And this is interesting, it actually shows the finger marks of the potter uh, where he started the clay from the large hump of clay that was on the wheel. So Friday Zone viewers, the next time you're in a museum admiring the artifacts on display, remember the archaeological process that took place. There was a team of archaeologists and researchers working together to uncover the story behind the objects you're viewing. It's the real deal. They are the real artifact. They're a real connection with the people who used them and made them. And the more complete that that artifact can stay, the more information we get from it. Maybe one day, you may be a part of the next big discovery. Until then, stop by the Indianapolis Children's Museum's Treasures of the Earth exhibit to see real scientists at work as you unearth some discoveries for yourself. And to work with real scientists to, uh, to be part of a real discovery and make make that all come alive for kids and, and, and have it be real is, is what we're all about. Did you know that the study of an ancient culture and its origin is anthropology? It is the scientific study of human beings, of us, and our way of life. You can find out some cool things about people just by looking at the stuff they have. I bet if I took a look in your room, I would find out the games you like to play, what kinds of sports keep you active, even who you look up to by the posters on your wall. When researchers find these things from people in the past, we call them artifacts. Come with us as we gain a little culture in this zone investigation. The Friday Zone field crew traveled to the Mathers Museum on the campus of Indiana University to get a little education about different cultures. As you explore the diverse exhibits at the museum, you quickly find out that people from all around the world are different. We categorize some of these differences to be cultural. Culture is a combination of patterns, traits, and products considered as the expression of a particular group, community, or period in time. We spoke to Jeff Conrad, who explained the purpose of collecting items that are part of different societies. Our main goal is to inform people and interest them in cultures and culture. When people actually get their hands on the things that other people make, they establish a direct connection with those people and really begin those, those other people's lives come alive for them. That's why we collect things. At the Mathers Museum, you can find collections from Latin America, Africa, even cultural items from the USA from different periods of time. We found that across history and locations on the globe, people created objects to fit their needs or desires. Even the need to transport a baby can be very different between cultures. When you compare these similar objects side by side, you start to develop an insight into that culture. It's the things you have to do are the same for everybody. People find different ways of doing them, different answers to the questions, different solutions to the problems. 
Next, we got a chance to go behind the scenes of the museum and see the collection storage room. There was so much more to see. And Ellen Sieber, the curator at the museum, explained to us her role in keeping up with these artifacts. My principal assignment is to make sure that whatever we know about an object stays with it and that we learn as much as we can about it. Uh, we do have about 28,000 objects in the collection. Typically, at any one time, we only have three or maybe at most 5% of those on exhibit. A lot of people will ask, well, why don't you show them all? Well, if you look around, this is a crowded space. People can't learn about the objects because there's not enough space around them to talk about them. Another reason for keeping the artifacts in storage is for protection. The collection storage room is climate controlled to keep the room at the optimum temperature. There are special lights that won't cause any harm to the items, and even cold storage for the items that are particularly sensitive. Ellen explains why this special care is needed. The reason for that is they're not just here for right now, but we're holding them in trust for the future. And as museum professionals, that's one of our first duties, is to make sure that things will be here as long as they can be. Keeping these items safe is an important role for a curator, but the research of finding out the item's purpose is just as important. So we look at objects and ask questions of them. We almost interview them as though they were people. We ask, where was it made? What's it made from? How was it made? And those are very simple, but sometimes hard to answer questions. But then to really understand more about the culture that made or used the object, we ask questions that get really to the core of how culture shapes our lives. So remember, Friday Zone viewers, culture shapes each of our lives differently. And at a museum like the Mathers Museum, you can explore a civilization from the past and see how they overcame some of the same problems you face today. That's what culture does. And that's why cultures are different, because there's never just one answer to a problem. People of the past had some of the same basic needs of people of today. And you can tell a lot about a society when you compare these things side by side. Today in The Zone, we have Sarah Hatcher to teach us what we can learn from these comparisons. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Emily. I'm glad you're here in The Zone with us today. Now, first, let's start out by what are artifacts? Because I see you have tons of them in here with us today. Sure, that's a really good question. Artifacts are things that are made by humans mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes they're kept in museums so that we can study and research and keep them around so that your great grandkids have them to learn from. So from the very beginning to even times that haven't even developed yet, it's mm -hmm. important to keep these things preserved and to keep finding them and researching them to see how they connect with each other. So I see some bottles and some glass that look kind of old but pretty new at the same time. What are these? Well, um, we all know 7-Up. It's been around for a long, long time. Um, this is a relatively modern bottle, probably you know 40 or 50 years old, mm -hmm. but it's important too because it helps us learn about the recent past and we can learn about the people and when we look at where it was found, we know that the people in that neighborhood had enough money to buy soda and other things like that. Yes, so glass seems to be sort of prevalent in this era of these artifacts. Now, I see the ones next to it, they kind of are a little different, and we all know sure. arrowheads, but even these in themselves are different. Can you kind of take us on a tour of these? Sure, um, I brought several different projectile points, and they're all made out of different types of materials, and you can learn a lot about artifacts by what they're made out of. And in the case of projectile points, you can learn even more when you look at the different shapes. Uh -huh. Because you'll notice that this one is a very different shape than this it one. Is. And they even feel a or, different. Mm -hmm. Or even this one. Uh -huh. And there's some great books out there that are almost like bird guides, mm -hmm. except they're for projectile points. Oh. And so you can look up these projectile points and then figure out exactly what they are and when they're from. Oh my gosh. Okay, so it's very helpful. And you kind of speak about research. Um, um, research comes with each of these artifacts, is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, archaeologists and researchers and historians all spend an awful lot of time digging through information and trying to see what they can piece together. All right, well, these next pieces look a little bit more intricate than our arrowheads. Mm -hmm. This guy has actually become sort of one of my favorites. Um, what does this tell us about that time period that this is from? Well, um, this piece is one that I don't have a lot of information about, and it's mm -hmm. one that I'm, I'm looking at right now. 
I know that it's broken. Mm -hmm. It's an unglazed piece. Um, but whoever was doing it obviously had a little bit of artistic flair and yes. the time to do art. So we know that they were a society that had the time and the, the uh, energy to engage in that kind of work. Which are great observations to take down when taking notes. Mm -hmm. And as we move to our next pieces, it's kind of important to first notice the writing on this. And I also saw some writing on the other pieces. What is the purpose of that? Well, I'm glad you noticed that because that's really important to us at the museum. Um, just like you have a student ID number mm -hmm. or I have a driver's license number, each individual artifact gets a number so that when we want to know more we can look it up in our computer and then go look at all the research that's already oh, wow. been done or add to that research if we've done more and need to add to it. So it's like each individual piece has its own database of history and observations that can be added to and changed as other pieces are observed, right? Absolutely. So these broken tiny pieces, how are these important to artifacts of history and our knowledge of the future? Well, these are important pieces because they show us different styles of pottery, mm -hmm. and these are styles that we know about. So okay. when an archeologist brings in something that they've just excavated, they have something to compare it about because okay. you can see that this piece mm has very different designs than this piece. It does. And this one has almost no designs, but a very nice red color. You're right. Now I'm looking at these and at that first piece of pottery mm -hmm. that we picked up at the beginning, obviously that was more modern, but what does this kind of tell you about the availability of, you know, almost even just the gloss of this to those? Well, um, you can look at a lot of different things when you look at pottery. And one of the things that it's important to consider is what are they using it for? Um, a lot of these pieces were probably from pots that were used for food storage. Mm -hmm. When we see a nice glossy piece from the modern yes. era, we know it was probably used for food. But yeah. if, you know, if we found a flower pot, it wouldn't have that nice sheen Exactly. To it. And so it's nice to see the available products that we use that mm -hmm. have sort of evolved over time. And I think that's the biggest thing I've noticed is the evolution of these pieces. And with history, you know, things change from being a storage container to a food container mm -hmm. to, you know, a, a flower pot or, you know, all the extra things included. But I think I'm more curious about how do we keep these preserved? Oh, well, one of the best ways to keep them preserved is by making sure that you keep good track of everything, mm -hmm. and that includes the information. Okay. And then, of course, we also have to make sure we store everything really, really carefully. And in our museum, we use a lot of different storage techniques. Yes. Um, some really little drawers and some really big cabinets. But as long as they keep it together, it allows us the opportunity to go out and explore. And I think that's the best thing that you've taught us here today mm -hmm. is to just keep our mind open and our observations ready and take notes and we too can explore history. Absolutely. Thanks, Sarah. We now have seen how researchers discover analyze and piece back together objects with their tools. So let's join Taylor and his friends Abby and Ben who have a way for you to pretend to be an archaeologist at home. Taylor. Thanks Emily. Alright guys, this craft is called the dig. This is a cool way for you to pretend to be an archaeologist with a friend. First, every dig starts in the dirt. So for that, we are going to create our modeling sand, which we are calling Awesome, awesome Sand. sand. Alright, so what you need for that is sand, you need cornstarch. You also need food coloring. We have blue and a cold glass of water. Also remember to keep a big bowl to mix it all in. Big spoon. And if you need any help, ask mom and dad and keep rubber, rubber gloves handy because you don't want to get the dye on your hands. It gets really messy. You'll be on there for days. So the recipe calls for three cups of sand, one and a half cup of cornstarch, three cups of cold water, and food dye. So let's start, Ben. Hand me that uh, cup of cornstarch. You reach it there? All right. Put it on in there. Put it all in? Yeah. Good. Okay. Grab the water. Got the water. Dump her in there. All right. Abby, start mixing that up for me. Now, right now, we're making what we call the slurry. So you want to make sure you mix it all in there. You don't want to get any lumps. And that's how you know it's, it's nice and uh, awesome. Awesome. -y awesome. For our awesome. Sand. awesome you got it going there? Here, let me try real quick. Uh, ben, you want to grab the sand for me? Sand. Sand. Got it. And just start adding it in while I, while okay. I uh, mix it. Got to get these lumps nice. out. Oh, yeah. This is going to be awesome. Okay, keep going. There we go. All right. Woo! Mm -hmm. Okay, and you might want to get in there with your hands. Let's all put our hands in here and start mixing it around. Mm -hmm. There we go. Now this is starting to work. 
Hey Ben, you wanna grab that uh, food coloring? Yeah. So since the sand's kinda yellow, we've got some blue food coloring, we're gonna get a nice green. So, Abby, you wanna yeah. put some of that in there for me? Okay. Now I'm gonna put it All right, so we would mix this up, yada, 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 but we are a television show, and with our TV magic, we already have some made. So we've got purple and green. So now, we're gonna do the activity. So remember, you can uh, double or triple this recipe, and now we're gonna hide treasures of our own. So, Hi, treasure. Abby, this is your sand. And that's my Ben, sand. this is your sand. Where's your sand? I don't need sand. Of course so you what do. are the things that we're gonna, what do you guys have to hide today? Oh, a unicorn hat. Okay, so put that in your tub. Okay. Abby, what do you have? I have a couple of sheet, seashells. I mean, you have some toys, some rings. You can hide all kinds of things to be an archaeologist. So, uh, what do you, what, and you have, what, what is this right here? This is a starfish and it, it it's broken. Oh cool, so you could even hide the pieces of it and yeah. they can find the pieces and put it together. Well anyways, so Ben, put your artifacts in there where you want them. Yeah. Abby, put your artifacts in there where you want them. And then, we'll start scooping your sand in there and you're gonna hide these and you guys will find them for each other later. Mm, yeah. After you're done hiding your objects in the sand, switch boxes, then you can use tools sim similar to archaeologists, such as the shovels. You can use a strainer to sift through and separate the sand from the objects, and you can also use a brush to help get all the extra sand off of your items you find on the dig. Well, while we continue digging, you can learn about the prehistoric time and visit one of America's largest fossil beds in this Friday's Own Flashback. The Friday Zone field crew traveled to Clarksville, Indiana to the falls of the Ohio State Park where you can see millions of years of Earth's history right below your feet. Did you know 390 million years ago the world looked a little different than it does now? The continents were not in the places that you and I know them today. And there was a sea that covered where you live. This period of time was known as the Devonian period or the Age of Fish. The sea that covered Indiana was full of life, including marine life and corals. This diorama from the exhibit's gallery at the park's interpretive center represents how scientists believe the Devonian Ocean may have appeared. This is based on fossil evidence at the park and from studies throughout the eastern United States. Several million years passed and the bones, skeletons, and other remains started to build up on the bottom of the sea, and the remains had become carbonized and made into rock, or limestone. Millions of years later, during the Ice Age, glaciers covered the northern half of North America. Over a period of two million years, they helped form the present-day Ohio Valley. These glaciers melted and then coupled with millions of tons of loose rocks filled the river valley and shaped the river that we know as the Ohio. The rushing Ohio River cut over the limestone, exposing fossils that had not been exposed for over 350 million years. That 350 million year old limestone at the Falls of the Ohio is composed of skeletons remaining from countless number of corals, sponges, brachiopods, mollusks, arthropods, and microscopic organisms. Another thing that might catch your eye as you're scouring the banks of the river is large limbs of wood known as petrified wood. Petrified wood is wood from trees and other vegetation that is so old through time, and a process called pre-mineralization has turned to stone. It is said that some 13,000 years ago, the first hunters followed the Ice Age animals, including the great mastodons and mammoths, to this area and settled because of the rich and bountiful resources that the Ohio River provided. Have you ever heard about the great adventures of Lewis and Clark? Well, it is on this site in 1778 that George Rogers Clark and his group of militia settled and explored the uncharted territories of the area and out west in the Louisiana Purchase, giving us the town that we know today as Clarksville. These fossil beds at the Falls of the Ohio are considered to be among the largest natural fossil beds in the world. Over 300 species of fossils have been identified at the falls. 
Now today, the falls are used for its educational and recreational purposes. Tourists from around the area can explore the fossil beds, walk the shores and pick out the number of different species that the beds have to offer, learn about the falls in the Interactive Interpretive Center, or just relax on the banks of the Ohio River and enjoy the wildlife that this area has to offer. But remember, walking on the beds does not harm the 350 million year old windows to our past, but fossil collecting does. So taking home any fossil is prohibited. Pictures will have to be the only thing that you take home from these fossil beds. So Friday Zone viewers, if you are interested in finding out what exactly the falls have to offer and see just how many different fossils you can identify, then visit www.fallsoftheohio.org to learn more. It is at the Falls of the Ohio where the earth reveals its own ancient story that has become our own. Now, Abby and Ben have switched bins, and let's see what they found. Ben, what did you find so far? Uh, you found a lot. Yes, I did. What did you find there? What's that? A ring. A ring. Abby, what would you find? Shelves? I only found a starfish and uh, this little dude. Oh, a little action figure guy. Now, with some of these things, um, if things are broken, like oh, Ben, yeah. what did you find here that was broken? A starfish piece, right? Yes. You can take your magnifying and glass. You can kind of examine that, see how the different parts go together, see what's inside of these broken parts. Yeah, there's like blood in it. Yeah, there's was all it, kinds of crazy stuff. Was it stuff. hard to find those pieces since they were scattered apart? Kind of. To figure out that they went together? Mm -hmm. mm, you're you're a good digger. Yes, I am. What do you guys think would be good things to hide in these containers? Um, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, I mean, just anything little, really. Just, yeah. You know, you can also hide things in your own backyard, and then someday, you know, someone well, else might quarter. find your artifacts. Like yeah. you learned Ben just keeps Sarah. finding things. Ben's it's, finding everything. It's I just found another can thing. Be another shell. Yeah. Awesome. Wonderful stuff. Oh, what other quarter? Wait, no, this is not a quarter. What'd you get? A nickel. nickel. Honestly, oh, the possibilities okay. are endless. Well, you guys, I'm glad you had fun, but that's all the time that we have for this week. Oh, we want to thank Sarah Hatcher for the history lesson. She was amazing. We would also like to thank you two amazing kids, Ben and Abby, for coming around and digging with us today. Remember, if you're inspired to explore or discover new things, you may only have to look as far as your own backyard. Don't forget to write to us about your experiences and discoveries at www.fridayzone.org. Make sure to download this and other episodes of The Friday Zone for free on iTunes. And remember to live, learn, and play The Friday Zone way. We will see you right here again next week. Bye-bye. All right, guys. Let's keep digging. The bus playing in the sea. Production support for the Friday Zone is provided by the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation and by WTIU members. Thank you.